their kids to make the same mistake. It, it, it pays, to be honest. But what – not making an excuse for my parents' generation here, but what they were using is just completely different from what's out there now. Because, frankly, it comes down to what this chart says in terms of average THC being around 15%. Folks, we've just become much better farmers, right? That's just the, and that's just the bottom line. And, you know, in the 60s and 70s, you wanted Mexican marijuana because you wanted that was better, a better high because the marijuana in the U.S. was very bad. That's totally flipped. I mean, it's, you know, made in the USA, homegrown is just much better in terms of the high than anything grown in Mexico or anywhere in the vicinity of our country. And so um, we've learned with the lighting, with the indoor, with the outdoor grows, all of these very sophisticated things to increase the THC and essentially breed out other components. And I, I don't know how many of you have heard of CBD for epilepsy. I know that made the news recently when uh, last year with the governor. Uh, there is no CBD in modern marijuana. Okay, So if anyone's going to tell you, we need to legalize weed in New Jersey because the kids need something for seizures, it, it's like saying we need to legalize you know, heroin because granny might need morphine. I mean, they're, they are related because they come from the same plant, but they're two totally different things. In fact, heroin and morphine are much closer together than CBD and THC. CBD doesn't get you high. It actually takes the high away. So there's no CBD in street marijuana because you don't want CBD to be in your marijuana that you sell because you're trying to sell marijuana that gets people high. That's the whole point. And so, um, you know, what parents don't get is that we've even learned to extract super high potent THC marijuana, 98% even. And if I would have told you there was 98% pot in a meeting 10 years ago when I was last year, you should have laughed me out of the room because there was no such thing. But we have since learned through butane techniques and uh, d complicated things that, you, like I said, you could find on YouTube, um, how to extract all of the THC. So you have things that are like brown, sticky substances hanging on the edge of a needle. I mean, let me tell you, that looks like another drug. It doesn't, but that is THC. It's not heroin. Your eyes will tell you it's heroin, but it's not. And all of these, this is just kind of the hash oil caplets, the earwax, butane, ha they're all the same thing, shatter. And it is here in New Jersey. It's in all across the country. And frankly, it's, I mean, let me tell you, Cheech and Chong and their wildest dreams couldn't have come up with this. Um, it's just the, the potency. There's no way to smoke this because you can't smoke anything over around 40 or so percent THC. It's impossible. It's unstable in the flower. You can't get that. But if you use this technique, you can extract almost all of the THC. And that's absolutely legal and for sale in Colorado, even under the guise of medicine. Um, that that's that's what's out there, and 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 I don't think most parents know about this. And I just a quick thing: I was at a, a school. Some of you heard the story in the Midwest recently, and they said we're going to introduce. You know, here's Dr. Sabet about to come and speak to you kids. He's going to talk about that roach clip that get passed around at your parties. All right, when she said roach clip, uh, she might as well have been speaking Japanese. These kids had absolutely no idea. And I think they thought it was some kind of insect extermination technique. Or what's that? And so that kind of went over their head. And then a kid in the back, sort of the supposedly quote unquote troublemaker, raises his hand and says, and, and the vice principal sort of like, you know, wincing, okay, yes, Johnny, you have a question before Kevin. And he says, yeah, is he going to talk about dabs? And he you know, said it that fast. And she's like, speak slower. What is he talking about dabbing? And she was like, no. Sit down. He's talking about marijuana, you know, roofer, reefer, uh, you know, ganja, uh, whatever. And, you know, that to me, I'm just telling you that, that to me represents the disconnect that we have like these, you know, the, the new um, empty nesters. Some of you might be that, you know, the kids have moved out who are like, it's legal now or it's going to be legal soon. You know, either one. We're going to try marijuana. I haven't used marijuana in 30 years. It's time to be free. And you what th their concept of what today's marrow, and I haven't even begun to tell you about the edibles, the cookies, the brownies, the chocolates, the lollipops, the gummy bears, the, all that stuff. We'll talk about that in a second, why that's even, I would argue, sometimes more dangerous than smoking. Um, and, and it's like clueless. The emptiness, I hate to say it, clueless about these things. And they say, well, you know, my kid's 21, so I'm going to like, you know, we'll smoke pot together and dad and father and son bonding and just like over a beer. Totally clueless. 
about what today's marijuana is like and, and what the effect is on even a 21-year-old's brain. Um, I don't normally quote High Times Magazine. I know you're going to be shocked at that. But, you know, once in a while there's some nuggets of joy here that are, I have to share. And they essentially, before you read that, I'll read it for you. They did a story that essentially said, hey, stoners, calm down with the, with, the, with the BHO, you know, honey oil and wax stuff, dabbing. You're giving pot a bad name. You know, we're kind of like the peaceful drug here that we just, you know, the peace pipe and all that. You're blowing up buildings and crazy things on needles. Just chill a little bit. You're going to give us a bad name. And I think that was very interesting. And they, they said, you know, you don't want to do this all the time because, as they said, with dabs, your local action news team gets to do a pot story that shows crack pipe torches used on sticky heroin looking goo made from a process that blows up like meth labs. Do you think that most Americans think of marijuana in this way? Absolutely not. Why? Because they're watching, you know, a, a, pardon my French, a stupid CNN special saying that this is the best thing since sliced bread. Or they're Googling marijuana and reading about what the industry says about it. Or they're reading stories that, unfortunately, the media has totally given a green pass to the industry, never questioning the industry, um, talking about how wonderful it is and how they're trying to control and regulate and be responsible and do all this stuff. By the way, when's the last time we controlled and regulated anything in a decent way? How's that going with alcohol? No kids are getting it. We've really regulated it. All the treatment is paid for for alcohol because we tax it. What happened? We're not, we don't pay for that. What about the lottery? You have the lottery here. Yeah. Schools, number one in the nation, funded, fully funded, teachers paid the way they should be. That's what we were promised with the lottery, folks. That's what we were promised with alcohol and tobacco. We won't even begin to talk about Atlantic City. How's that going? No offense to anybody there. Right? So we, th all these like false promises that we always get. And meanwhile, we don't talk about the costs. You know, what are the costs of more kids using, da you know, dabbing and all these kinds of things? Um, the em I won't go, you can see this later, the emergency room admit. People say emergency room. How can that even be possible, emergency room admissions for marijuana? Well, folks, when you're smoking 20% THC or dabbing 80% THC, uh, and your brain isn't especially not used to that, you know, yeah, you will absolutely probably have a panic attack, right? You will, th this, is, this is becoming very common, ER admissions, and people are thinking, how could they ever go to the ER? We're seeing it. When you look at educational outcomes, l l it's not rocket science to say that, you know, marijuana doesn't exactly make you the sharpest tool in the shed, um, but it really is connected in a very strong way, even when controlling for income and other demographics. It is very closely correlated with dropping out of school and lower scores on tests. And um, I think actually teachers need to care about this as much as parents and students because teachers get graded on the success of their students. And if we're gonna be saying you know, that pot's okay, and you know, well, we're not, we're not saying pot's okay for kids, but we're gonna put an age limit on it just because you know, we know that always works. Um, uh, uh, but we know that more kids will use it if it's legal. Um, we really have to look at this from an education point of view. And I, and I look at this from, an, and I know we have some elected officials, I look at this from an economic competitiveness point of view, too. Um, you know where we rank in education? Not in the state, but in the, the U.S. As in terms of the top 35 industrialized countries in the world. Um, well, let me get to it. It's, it's really not pretty, actually. We rank 28 out of 30 European countries overall in marijuana use. In other words, the high, like, the no one of the highest here in terms of the, the, the use. And then in terms of international rankings of educational achievement, um, we're dead last on math, like literally dead last. Uh, Shanghai, China, and Singapore are, do you think that they're smoking, the kids are, they're talking about legalization in Shanghai or Singapore? And let me tell you something, if, you're, if you think your kids are gonna be competing with the guy down the street for the job at the post office, that's not how it's, what it's like anymore. We are in a global economy. They absolutely are competing with Shanghai, China, and Singapore. And yet, while they're talking about how to improve their educational system and how to you know, treat teachers in the right way to keep their, their test scores to be the highest in the world, we're talking about pot. We're, we're, we're talking about dabbing and edibles 
while they're talking about education. Yeah, good luck. I mean, I, good luck to us on that. I really think we have to think, I'll take questions at the end. I really think we have to, we have to think about that. And um, by the way, we're 24th in reading and 27th in science there too. And when you look at what it does to IQ, you know, if there was one study to, that I would have highlighted, it would be this one. And this study essentially said that for the folks that smoked three times a week for three years of their life around that, um, versus folks that didn't smoke, there was an eight point reduction in IQ, an eight point difference. Now, what does eight points mean, you might be thinking? Well, if you're Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, it probably doesn't mean much, <laughs> right? You have 150 IQ, and I understand every, all the parents, how many parents do we have in here? A lot of parents, your kids are all the geniuses, right? They're 150, so you don't have to hear this part. But for the ones that aren't geniuses, you know, because the average grade is, the average IQ is 100, not 150. When you lose eight points off of 100, folks, that is almost what we call in science a standard deviation, meaning that almost brings you from, from one level between average, above average, and below average, from average to below average, almost there. From below average to forget about it, from above average to average. That is the difference between graduating high school for some people, right? That is the difference between getting the job you want and the job you have to settle for. And for the guys that say, Kevin, I get A's and B's, and I'm doing just fine, and I smoke pot on the weekends, and it's not affecting me at all, because I know there are kids that say that. And they probably there are kids that absolutely can get away with it, no doubt about it. It's not going to affect everyone this way. But there's one little problem with that logic, <laughs> and that is, do they intend to ever get a job? Because every job, unless you start your own business, will drug test. I mean, I, if it's le people say, well, but it's going to be legal. Let me tell you something. If it's going to be legal, they're going to drug test 10 times more. So, uh, it, you know, it, it, that's not going to take the drug testing need away. It's, it's increasing drug testing, actually. In Colorado, employers are increasing the drug testing because of all the problems they're having. By the way, they're, they're actually having to hire out of the state in the construction business over there. Um, you could read an article in the Colorado Springs Gazette that talked about that. Um, they're talking about the rampant cheating that's going on. They're talking about when they announce to people they drug test, 80% of their applicant pool does not call back, does not actually apply. Um, so when we want to think about the, the, you know, the workforce and testing, I think we have to think about that as well. Um, folks, uh, when you look at basically every kind of outcome we care about, welfare dependence, uh, income, getting a university degree, depression, all of these kinds of things, basically what it says is among the average of thousands of people, your chances go up for, for a negative outcome. Doesn't mean that, e now, uh, don't get me wrong, I am not saying that every single person is gonna be on welfare if they use marijuana or flunk out of school. No, I'm not. I'm saying your chances go up. And I don't think kids today even know that. You know, I, I would be satisfied even if they continue using it the way they do. I hope they don't, but even if they did, at least if they knew what they were getting themselves into, I think, because I think smart, the smarter ones would make better decisions. Um, but right now, th this information really is not out there at all. And you want to talk about mental illness. We, don't, we could have a whole day on this. But, folks, the connection between, I just highlighted two studies, but the connection between psychosis, which is you know, the short term, like a psychotic episode, for example, kind of like the thing that killed the young African exchange student uh, after he ate a marijuana edible in Colorado and he fell off of, he jumped off of a balcony because he thought the lights were attacking him and his friends were attacking him. That's a panic attack, which usually doesn't result in death like it did for Levi, but um, could result in, you know, usually, you know, a lot of problems as having a panic attack is not pleasant. Or long-term schizophrenia. The connection with the long-term is something even more frightening, I think, if you look into what schizophrenia can do to somebody and their family. Um, doesn't mean everyone using pot it regularly is going to get schizophrenia, again. But again, the chances go up, and that's where, that's where we have the, the problems. Driving. <laughs> when I talk to kids about this, I'll get a, I got someone the other day who said, Kevin, I drive better when I'm stoned. <laughs> I said, really? Where did you hear that? <laughs> well, you know, I've read that, and, you know, I've read these studies, and I've read things, and they've said that. Okay, well, uh, have you driven stoned? Yeah, and I do drive better. I drive 35 and a 70. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't re not realizing that 90 and a 70, is that's about the same thing. Right? 
And um, and there is this perception, though, and it's not really funny that that driving while stoned is safer. And in reality, it's one of the leading causes of deaths for substance. It's actually the second leading cause of death on the road for substance after alcohol. It's alcohol, marijuana, and then alcohol and marijuana together. And let me tell you, alcohol and marijuana together is much more dangerous than alcohol alone. And kids are using these things together. You know, the idea that, well, kids will make the choice. Yeah, right. Like the guy who smokes pot every day is, you know, I don't want I don't touch that beer. I make good decisions. What? what world are people living in? I mean, <laughs> just hang out with a teenager for a little bit, and you'll see. You know, the guy that's going to risk maybe smoking a pot, he's usually not going to be, you know, um, uh, uh, carry nation when it comes to, you know, alcohol. And, and yet, you know, we, we, we see that happening. And so I think the driving thing is a huge part of it. Now, so I would just want to say, overall, I think the gulf has never been greater between the scientific understanding and the public's misunderstanding. You know, if you go and hang out at the conference of the American Medical Association or the American Psychiatric Association or the American Academy of Pediatrics or on and on and on, there's no... You know, the science is clear. I mean, this is not, yes, there's a debate here and there about this power and that and this study. But overall, that's why these groups have positions against legalization and in favor of a science-based policy. But again, just like most Americans aren't reading these journals, they're not hanging out at the conferences of the American Medical Association. <laughs> they're watching TV and seeing how wonderful it is in Colorado. Um, Someone asked me the other day, I thought it was really poignant, sort of how did we get here? And, I, and really, how we got here has to do with the second myth that I want to talk about briefly, smoked marijuana as medicine, okay? How we got here, folks, is that the stoner stereotype used to look like this guy, right? When you thought of marijuana, it was the 35-year-old guy who lived in his mom's basement and, you know, eats pizza every night, delivery, and isn't really doing much in his life, right? Not exactly the kind of person that our elected officials are like, I'm standing up for the 35-year-old stoner without a job. No, okay, not exactly a political force, okay? But the legalization groups, and people under, underestimate them, are, were brilliant from a PR perspective because they said, we got to change the image here, guys. We, we're not going to get far. we got to change the image from the 35-year-old guy that no one cares about to the 85 year old granny dying of cancer right because who can say no to her um especially in a state like this a lot you have a lot of italian grandmothers nobody can say no to them <laughs> no but really like you can't how can you and um and and so it was basically like we're gonna you know we got to talk about the medical side. And by the way, now this picture has been replaced with the four, I mean, like the one class of person that's even more like, you know, heartstrings, the four year old with 100 seizures a day. I mean, you can't get more, right? So, and, and so what they did was basically said, look, we got to make this about medicine and about medical. Now, sort of <laughs> disentangling that is really important because let me just be very clear there are medicinal properties of the marijuana plant, okay? And there are ways to extract those properties, and I know this is gonna sound crazy, but dispense them in a pharmacy by doctors. I know, crazy, I know, right? As opposed to saying, you know what we're gonna do with pot? Forget about the research and the thing. What we wanna do, forget about the pharmacy and the doctor and the side effects and the interaction effects. What we wanna do is have a store just for pot, because it's medical and put it next to the you know pizza store over here and we're going to have a guy with no medical experience um with the 300 pound bouncer outside guarding the door because we're only cash only and we're going to sell you something that has no dosage because we're essentially set selling you flowers and le a leaf mixture and that's what we're going to call it with medicine um oh and we're going to vote on it we're not going to have science look at it. We're going to have the people vote whether this is medicine or not. Folks, it just doesn't make any sense. It's like, you know, then you go to them and say, okay, well, uh, what's the dosage? Well, there is no dosage. It's a leafy mixture that you mix together. Okay. Uh, what's the side effects? Well, it kind of depends on who you are. And like this person, my friend said that this strain was better than that strain and that. Hmm. Okay. Uh, what about if you're 10 versus 50 versus, you know, 70? Is there a difference? Well, we're not really sure. What does it interact with any other drugs? Uh, you know, it did it for her. She, it did. Uh, we're not sure what drug. Yeah, I never heard of that one. I don't know. 
Folks, this is how we're doing medicine. It makes absolutely no sense. Let's treat it like a medicine. It's the radical idea that we should treat it like a medicine, do the research. If somebody has you know, a, a debilitating illness and has the seizures that could benefit from CBD, if somebody has you know, nausea related to cancer and none of the, you know, most oncologists would never think about marijuana. We have much better drugs, but imagine those drugs didn't work for them and so they're willing to try anything, great. Let's, let's have it in a pharmacy and treat it like a medicine, not politicize it and, 